Hello. Welcome to this worship service on the second Sunday of Easter. I am Reverend Dr. Julie Mavity Madalina. I am university chaplain, ethicist, and assistant professor of philosophy and religion at Lakeland University. And joining me to um, offer this service today are other folks from Lakeland that I am excited to introduce. We've got Reverend Dr. Carl Kuhn, who is Professor of Religion, Grace Chair of Religious Studies, and Dean of the School of Humanities and Fine Arts at Lakeland. We also have Mark Schmidt on the piano. Mark is a student at Eden Theological Seminary, and he is interning with us this year. And we also have Cal McCauley, who is a junior at Lakeland, and she is the chaplain's assistant. They are the chaplain's assistant and um, also do music with us. And we are excited to be here and also want to offer a special thanks to First Congregational United Church of Christ in Plymouth, Wisconsin, for hosting us and recording today's service. So let us be together in worship. Please join me responsibly in the call to worship. Strengthen our faith at this resurrection time, O God. Give us the courage of Mary Magdalene. Strengthen our faith at this resurrection time, O God. Give us the honesty of Thomas the Apostle. Strengthen our faith at this resurrection time, O God. Strengthen our faith at this resurrection time, O God. Give us an active spirit of the risen Christ. Christ be praised. Alleluia. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. O God, bless us in the second Sunday of Easter, a Sunday when we are still exploring the shocking and wonderful reality of resurrection. As we enter this space from wherever we are, breathe on us. Flood our senses with your comforting presence so that we may experience you and your community with our whole selves. Thank you for your faithfulness and for your willingness to take on what it means to live in a vul vulnerable, human body. In the name of the one who lived, breathed, died, and returned, we pray. Amen.
Friends, as believers in the risen Christ, we are called to examine our faithfulness to God's covenant with us. Please join me responsibly in our prayer of confession. Like the soldier at the foot of the cross, we do our duty and good people get hurt. Like Pilate in his palace, we are quick to put the responsibility for our decisions onto someone else. Give us the courage, O God, to stand firm for what is right and to accept the responsibility that is ours alone. Like Peter in the courtyard, we are ready to deny the highest part of ourselves if there are going to be unpleasant circumstances. Give us the wisdom, O God, to avoid the easy way that leads to guilt which does not go away. Like Thomas in the upper room, we doubt the fact that Jesus is risen. Give us the Easter strength, O God, to accept our doubts as stepping stones towards a more honest and dynamic faith. You accept the whole range of our falling short, O God, and you give us eyes to see its significance. Give us also the will to learn from our failure and the resolution to make a fresh start in the spirit of the risen Christ. Christ be praised. Your sins are forgiven. Peace is yours. When our minds churn like turbulent waters, Christ comes to offer us peace. When our lives careen out of control like cars on a frozen highway, Christ comes to offer us peace. Christ is here now, offering us peace. With the spirit of Christ within us, let us hold one another in our thoughts and in our hearts as we offer signs of peace from where we sit. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. God's word may be the balm our hearts most need in this time. Listen for God's truth, that you may find the balm of faith, peace, and love. Our psalm for today is Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is, when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Our gospel lesson today comes from John chapter 20, Verses 19 through 31. In the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked in the room where the disciples were for the fear of the temple authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Having said this, the Savior showed them the marks of crucifixion. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw Jesus, who said to them again, Peace be with you. As Abba God sent me, so I'm sending you. After saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. It happened that one of the twelve, Thomas, nicknamed Didymus, or twin, was absent when Jesus came. The other disciples kept telling him, we've seen Jesus. Thomas's answer was, I'll never believe it without putting my finger in the spear wound. On the eighth day, the disciples were once more in the room, and this time, 
Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them saying, Peace be with you. Then, to Thomas, Jesus said, Take your finger and examine my hands. Put your hand into my side. Don't persist in your unbelief, but believe. Thomas said in response, My Savior and my God. Jesus then said, You've become a believer because you saw me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs as well, signs not recorded here, in the presence of his disciples. But these have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten, so that by believing you may have life in Jesus' name. Let us pray responsively. Even though we have not seen the Lord, we can still love God. Even though we cannot touch God's hand, we can still believe. Gathered in spirit as the body of Christ, and seeing Christ's love in one another, we can say without doubt, We have seen the Lord. When we witness the hands that touch us, and behold the eyes that shine, Christ's love and peace, may we proclaim the faith. My, my Lord, Lord and my God. God. Friends, do not doubt, but believe. This time of the service is called Experiencing the Word, it is when we offer a special message for the younger members of our communities but the rest of you are welcome to listen along as well. I'm gonna be reading a version of the story of Thomas, and this is from the Family Story Bible. Don't ask so many questions, Thomas. That's what Thomas's teachers said in school. That's what Thomas's parents said at home. That's what Thomas's friends said. But Thomas couldn't help it. When the rabbi, the teacher, told them things in school, Thomas often asked, how do you know? Sometimes that made the rabbi angry. I know just because I know, Thomas. It is true because I say so. Thomas had to be quiet, but he didn't like the teacher's answer. Thomas was sad when his questions made people angry, but he could not stop asking. When Thomas grew older, he became one of Jesus' special friends. He became a disciple. Thomas liked Jesus because Jesus never told him to stop asking questions. One day, Jesus was trying to explain what was going to happen. I'm going away, said Jesus. I'm going to get a place ready for you, a place with many rooms. God has, God's house has room for you and for everyone else. You know the way to God's house. No, we don't, said Thomas. What is the way? That's a good question, Thomas, smiled Jesus. I am the way. If you really love me and love each other, then you know the way. I still don't understand all of it, said Thomas. That's okay, said Jesus. Just keep asking questions. Not long after that, Jesus died. He was killed by people who didn't like the way he said that God loved everyone. Thomas was very sad when Jesus was killed. So when some of the other disciples said that Jesus was alive again, Thomas really wanted to believe them. But he couldn't. His mind kept asking questions. How can somebody be dead and then be alive again? When some of the disciples told Thomas they had seen Jesus, Thomas asked, how can you be sure that it was Jesus? How do you know it wasn't somebody else? Because we saw him with our own eyes. They answered. Maybe, said Thomas, but I have to see for myself. I have to see the places in Jesus' hands where they put the nails. Otherwise, I won't believe it. A few days later, Thomas and his friends were together. All the doors were closed, 
but suddenly there was Jesus in the room with them. Jesus smiled at Thomas. Come here, my friend. Touch the places where they put the nails. It really is me. Thomas began to cry. He was so happy to see Jesus. Oh yes, it is you, Jesus. I'm so glad. Now I know you are alive again. I, will, I won't ask any more questions. Oh, don't stop asking questions, Thomas, said Jesus. I am glad you are able to see me so that you can be sure. Then you can believe. But there will be lots of people who won't be able to see me. They will ask questions too. It'll be hard for them to believe, just as it was hard for you to believe. I will need you to help tell my story. You mean you're not angry because I didn't believe right away that you were alive again? Thomas asked. No, not angry at all, said Jesus. I like it when people ask hard questions. But you won't understand everything, Thomas. You won't find answers to all of your questions. Just remember that I love you and that God loves you. Nobody can prove that part, but it is the part that is most true. I volunteered to preach this service because I really love the story of Thomas. I relate to the story of doubting Thomas. I'm a questioner and a doubter. Plus, I've been in enough associate ministry and pulpit supply positions to have been asked to preach on Thomas before because all your pastors deserve a break the Sunday after Easter. So, it did feel a little bit like cheating to offer to preach this particular sermon. But you will perhaps be happy to know that as soon as I dove into today's story, I found the Spirit leading me in an entirely different direction than I've ever taken with it. So it turns out I had to work for it after all. The shift for me started with the words locked room, which sound an awful lot like lock down, which feels a little close to home. Suddenly, I was more in tuned with the charged atmosphere of that locked upper room than I was with abstracted, rational ideas about cognitive ascent. What I realize in a new way this time is that this story is a story of trauma. The disciples have experienced a horrifying spectacle of brutality and torture and terror. Their entire worlds have been flipped upside down and inside out, and they are overwhelmed with anxiety and fear and grief. And in that state, they are hunkered down together, locked in a room in shock. Now, trying to process an additional shocking experience. Theologian Shelley Rambo works at the intersections of trauma and theology. And she reports that when we are experiencing trauma, our brains respond by shifting from our hippocampus, or our thinking center, into our limbic system. Or, if you've ever worked with children on emotional intelligence, our reptile brain. Meaning, when our brains are signaling danger, they immediately shift away from words to our bodies from cognition to the somatic. As we also know from post-traumatic studies, this trauma persists in our bodies long after the traumatic event, often 
far below the surface. For people post-trauma, the past keeps intruding on the present, and our brains keep telling our bodies that they're in danger. And because this trauma is lodged in our bodies and in our senses, it can't be processed and healed through thinking or through talking it out. Instead, we have to engage our senses and learn to use them in new ways as we witness difficult truths that will integrate that suffering into the present. And that is what brings healing. And Rambo points out that this story of the trauma and the healing in the upper room is a story situated in the limbic system, beyond the reach of our cognitive processes. So it turns out it's less about the doubts in our heads and more about healing and hope in our bodies. When Rambo delivered a series of lectures on this topic three years ago, she observed that given the realities of racialized violence and the Me Too movement, our entire culture is living in its limbic system. Now, I would hazard a guess that as, a, as we reflect on a year of anxiety and grief and communal lockdown, with continued attention to racialized violence, we are even more so locked into our collective limbic system. And like the disciples, we are also now adding a layer of hope, of new life, of resurrection, of post-trauma to our experiences of trauma these past years. So what? then, does this story teach us about the resurrected Jesus and how he brings healing and new life? First, when Jesus repeats, peace be with you, throughout both encounters in the upper room, it's not the light, but no doubt sincere, peace be with you, that we share during our passings of the peace. This peace be with you is an acknowledgement of the profound anxiety and grief in that room. It's Jesus' recognition that the hippocampus is offline and the limbic system is in control in this space. And so Jesus bypasses words and engages the senses. He shows the disciples the marks of crucifixion. And while they are joy-filled in their frontal lobes, are taking in this newly present Jesus, the confusion and the trauma clearly remain because Jesus has to say it again. Peace be with you. Trauma doesn't evaporate when the danger passes. Their limbic systems haven't fully taken in this new truth. And so... Jesus breathes on them. All trauma and mindfulness work centers the role of the breath in grounding and healing. Our breath is what directs and regulates the limbic system. It is powerful and it is sacred in every world religion. And so in breathing on them and connecting them to spirit or breath, as he says, peace be with you, Jesus is reorienting these traumatized disciples through their senses to a new reality, a new truth. And of course, Thomas misses that first healing moment in the locked upper room. His response, which we, as, which we have interpreted as being about the frontal lobe, probably because that's our cultural comfort zone, 
is actually one that is fully carnal. The Greek word Thomas uses for touch is intense. The best interpretation being to plunge his finger into Jesus' wound. He somehow knows that he has to engage his senses. And so, when Jesus reappears in that limbic-laced room, he again acknowledges it with his comforting peace be with you. And then he invites Thomas to use his sense of touch to integrate this new reality into his own body and to begin to heal from the trauma of Jesus' death. And here's what else I love about this story that we often miss. Jesus' wounds remain on his body post resurrection. They're not there only as a way to function for us to recognize Jesus. They remain because trauma leaves wounds, sometimes visible, more often invisible, like the iceberg where most of its mass actually lies beneath the surface of the water. We have a tendency to rush healing and recovery to push for progress, to celebrate bodies that are pure, perfect, whole. But that's not the gospel. The gospel says that bodies with wounds and scars are beautiful and fully alive, that we can joyfully celebrate new life and resurrection while we are still doing the embodied work of healing. This is good news, even as it's a challenge. While there can be danger in universalizing trauma, there is no doubt that almost all of us have experienced trauma in this pandemic. Whether from death or disability, from isolation or crushing care work, from disillusionment or frustration, from milestones and sports and special trips missed, our bodies have lived with tension and uncertainty and grief and anxiety for a year now. Our limbic systems have been in overdrive for an extended period of time. And what we know, particularly from bodies who have experienced the traumas of oppression for lifetimes and generations, is that our bodies remember. Our bodies keep the score. We get sick or weepy or irritable on the anniversary of a loss or a trauma, even if the date has escaped our conscious thought. And we ignore our embodied trauma to our own peril because it will have its way implicitly with our health if we do not deal with it intentionally. As we live into this one year anniversary of the pandemic, as we begin to think about taking steps away from lockdown, as we attempt to reckon with systemic racism and all forms of oppression, as we face any of our individual traumas, and as we begin to have hope, we need to acknowledge that our wounds remain. We have to get comfortable communally and individually with the discomfort of engaging our senses of feeling our feelings, of experiencing new realities, of integrating our wounds into new narratives. And the good news is that we have the resurrected Jesus with us, breathing on us and with us, and telling us as many times as we need to hear it until we feel it in our bones. Peace be with you. And when he says, blessed are those who believe, it's important to know 
that even here it's not about cognition. The Greek word for belief is a verb. Faithing is a better pre-enlightenment translation. The idea being that we are blessed when we keep living into our hope of life and love and healing that is rooted in our experience of a God who understands what it means to be embodied, who knows what it means to experience trauma, to bear the wounds, and to keep breathing as new life emerges. May God bless you. May God bless us as we do this sacred work together. Amen. The wealth of the world is not our own. The gifts of our lives are not our own. We are but stewards, granted the opportunity to share these gifts in service of God and one another. So wherever you are gathered and however you do this in your church, let us celebrate our offerings of our gifts with joy. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, the world and the times in which we live give us plenty of reason to doubt, plenty of reason to question that goodness can prevail over evil and that life can conquer death. It was not easy for Thomas to trust the good news of Easter. Sometimes it is not easy for us to trust this strange and wondrous news that the impossible really is possible, that bodies can be mended, that relationships can be repaired, that anxiety can be overcome, that loneliness can be surprised by friendship, that bitter division can turn us into community. And to believe that at the end of it all, you are there, still loving us, waiting to welcome us home in your realm of blessing and wholeness. It can be hard to trust in Easter. Most of us don't have the advantage of a real flesh and blood, wounded and healed, resurrected Jesus to reach out to touch. So Lord, reach out to us. Surround us with your presence and love. Reach out especially to those in our communities in need of your healing, strength, and guidance. We now lift them up before you in silence. And God, as you reach out to us, Help us to reach out to one another as stewards of your presence and love so that all of us, like Thomas, can feel it and know it to be real and true. We ask this in the name of our resurrected Savior, who taught us to pray for your love and life, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle. Draw the circle wide. Draw the circle. Draw the circle wide. No one stands alone. We'll stand side by side. Draw the circle. Draw the circle wide. Draw the circle wide. Draw it wider still. Thank you again for joining us today. And now we leave this community of the faithful renewed in the spirit to encourage the doubting, renewed in the spirit to encourage the downhearted, renewed in the spirit to encourage those who despair, and renewed in the spirit to be servants and advocates for love. Amen.
sorrow and no one does not know, does not know about pain. She said no one does not know, does not know about hunger and no one does not know, does not know about shame. She said all will be well, all will be well, all manner of things will be well. She said no one Baby girl, do you not know?